Good Thursday morning to you. I'm Mike Miano, pastor at the Blue Point Bible Church and director of the Power of Preterism Network. It is my privilege to uh, be co-hosting here with Edward Howell for our Preterist Power Hour, which we have now begun as a daily program, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, today, I'm excited. We have Johnny Ova joining the program, so uh, he'll be joining us here in a moment, and we'll be uh, leading in on some discussion in regards to the Mark of the Beast. I'm sure that did not come as a surprise to anyone, because that's what we've been talking about every day this week. So, uh, Edward, I'm sure you're as excited as I am. Uh, before I let you uh, introduce yourself, I just wanted to share a quote from the Daily Reflections for Highly Effective People, which is actually a resource I use in my daily devotions. And today, this was one of the readings, and I thought it, it directly applied to uh, what we're doing here with this daily program. But if you don't pay the price day in and day out, you never achieve true mastery of the subjects you study or develop an educated mind. I thought that was a uh, good reflection for us every day, taking an hour out to make sure we're studying some details, obviously here, highlighting the power of preterism, uh, seeing the, the power of fulfillment and understanding the audience relevance and things like that, that we'll lead in on here in a moment, some of that discussion. Yeah. But again, having that moment, it's a blessing. And uh, Edward, I'm curious to hear your thoughts in that regard. And of course, encourage you to introduce yourself and then lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. Um, my name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church and it's an honor and privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano and to have Johnny Ova as a guest today. I'm anxious and uh, eager to hear, you know, his story as well as what he has to offer. Um, I, I would like to lead us in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, please go before us, open our eyes, ears and minds and hearts, uh, give us focus and clarity that uh, the hearers may be able to uh, comprehend at a point where they can share with others and encourage them to uh, share and to open up dialogue and have discussions on these matters in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so amen. Edward, real quickly. Uh, so what did you think of that quote? How has this daily program or has it affected your, uh, your studies and uh, has it been a blessing? And do you see the value of achieving true mastery by day in and day out daily study? Well, daily, what you do daily, you know, determines, you know, uh, not only your calling, but uh, like what you do in a sense, as far as, you know, what you're to do in the Lord, you know, if what you find yourself doing, mm -hmm. you know, you find your your calling in, in other words. But you have doing important. this, yes. And in doing this program, you know, incorporating it in, into my life's uh, uh, walk, I find it edifying to where it's, you know, not, only do I get to share what I've learned, but I continue to learn through this program, you know, resources and things of this nature outside of the, the, the immediate of what I've been learning. You sure. know? Amen. So, yeah, it's a valuable thing every day. So, you know, uh, every day, one of my ways of uh, doing spiritual formation, if you will, is I mark out uh, something to celebrate about every day. So obviously today being Thursday, I always you know highlight Throwback Thursday. It's a day to kind of review some resources, uh, go back and and look at memories and consider different things. And this morning, you know, I'm excited to share a couple of throwbacks, uh, some resources and some thoughts in regards to Throwback Thursday. The first one is nine years ago yesterday, I debated Sam Frost. It was my first personal debate. Uh, obviously, I defended full preterism against whatever it was Sam Frost had contrived up at that time. Uh, he's, you know, developed something far different these days. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, he had a certain view at that time, and, and now he has something different. Uh, however, you could go back and watch that debate. I, I've now debated him twice. I debated him in 2013, and then I debated him, uh, I think it was 2017, uh, here in New York. Uh, you could go back and watch both of those debates on YouTube. I'll be sharing the, uh, the nine years ago debate as of yesterday on the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page, as well as on my personal page, and letting people get that as a resource to sort of review. Uh, also, uh, in, in line with our show today, 10 years ago today, uh, Johnny Ova and I became Facebook friends. And uh, again, as it I, uh, to you, Edward, you know, yeah, man, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I, uh, I mentioned to you, Edward, and maybe Johnny will lead in on this here in a, a little bit. Um, 
me and Johnny meeting on Facebook has been a very pivotal, a pivotal, there we go, pivotal, pivot. We're going to stop saying that word. We're going to try a different one. Uh, has been a very uh, powerful uh, moment in my life. It was a, a time of transition where obviously uh, I was ended. I ended up being called here to the Blue Point Bible Church. And uh, that was just a great moment, us meeting on Facebook. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit here in a moment. And then also uh, later today, I'm going to publish a personal review of 2021, chock full of resources and thoughts and studies that I had put together uh, back into all throughout the year of 2021. That will be available on my personal blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. And uh, so again, that's my throwback Thursday. Edward, I don't know if you have any throwback Thursday thoughts you want to mention before I kind of lean us in on our topic here of the mark of the beast. No, I have no throwback Thursdays or anything of that nature, <laughs> but I do have these confusing moments where I wake up, you know, and realize that I have a, a conscious existence and, and God gives me direction in life. You know, like I had mentioned earlier uh, or yesterday about uh, when you're born, you have a blank slate and all, all that you know is what you've been exposed to. Sure. So um, I'm glad that I'm always exposing myself and including this program that we do daily, um, exposing myself to the things of God, you know, that gives me, you know, direction, you know, where I don't, you know, find myself, you know, uh, confused and, you know, and in the days. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's, that's good. And, and it's good to have that, you know, th those disciplines where you know how they lead you in on understanding and, and uh, discerning the things of God. So um, let's, let's jump right into the topic here. I think that we've made excellent headway in talking about the mark of the beast. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're of the same sentiment. It seems like you would be. Uh, so we had Holger on yesterday. And uh, it was good to hear from Holger. And obviously, he provided thoughts in regards to Revelation chapter 13 and uh, what he calls the, quote, 666 man. And uh, if I may, uh, we've been talking about this book, Spirit and Life Lectures 2018, which I had the privilege of writing the commentary for Revelation chapter 14. Uh, Holger wrote the commentary for Revelation chapters 12 through 13, and, uh, and many others are, are contributors to this. And uh, he, he wrote something I want to share in regards to Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. I'm going to share that with you because it leads in on this topic here, and it kind of sums up what he, in my estimation at least, uh, what he had shared yesterday with us. Reading from the scriptures first, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which were granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, again, we know that this is talking about the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. And what Hoger says here in the commentary is the high priest and many of the Jewish authorities wanted peace with Rome, but the zealots would have nothing, none of it. The zealots officially instigated the Jewish war in 66 AD. Caesar worship was given into was given into when it served Jewish purposes, as the Jews had said it 40 years earlier. We have no king but Caesar. John chapter 19, verse 15. And then in the scriptures, it goes on, verses 16 through 17. He causes all, the second beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. So, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And Holger says, the mark of this beast was a spiritual marking, as was God's seal, 2 Timothy 2.19. Their foreheads may refer to their minds, and their hands may refer to their service. Some served sincerely, some only in hand. It appears that at least a good part of the Jews, at least for a time, would, rather, would give in rather than submit to death. And then he goes on to talk about, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And Holger said, uh, he pointed out in contrast to what many people often will say, Nero, uh, with the Hebrew gematria, Holger had pointed out that in the scriptures, we see a lot of reflection of 666 in regards to the temple and to the high priest. 
specifically. So uh, Holger offered up a, a contrasting view that, which I actually believe can be brought together, that it was the Romans and the Jews acting carnally uh, that were the beasts, uh, the picture of the beasts in that first century. So uh, Edward, I wanna give you a moment to just jump in. Uh, do you feel that was a good summary of what Edward, uh, what Holger had brought up yesterday on the program? I believe so, because I, I saw the I saw his uh, video and him speaking yesterday, and um, from what you described, um, I believe you and Holger are saying basically the same thing. Um, uh, it's just you're saying it like okay, like the synoptic gospels, how mm -hmm. they say it a little bit differently, but they're saying the same thing. Sure, you know, right. The same event. And basically, that's what I see, you know, so. Amen. Yeah, Holger's focusing more so in on the Jewish perspective of that second beast, uh, whereas, you know, I, I see that the, the, the sea beast, which he agrees is Rome, uh, is also a part of that discussion as well. So, uh, yes. you know, there's a lot there, but I encourage people to go back, review that session that we had with Holger yesterday. Get your hands on a copy of Spirit and Life Lectures 2018. Obviously, we've said that if uh, the, out of those that share, and I'm glad to say that we've had a lot of views uh, in the last couple of days with this daily program, it shows that it's been a success. Praise God. And uh, what we said is out of those that do share the, the program, uh, we'll choose somebody at random to receive a free copy of Spirit and Life Lectures 2018. And uh, once we see that on fr uh, this Friday, we'll uh, mark it out. So that'll be tomorrow. So Edward, I just want to, you know, I want to bring Johnny on. So what I want to do is just quickly review a couple more things. Uh, as we've talked about the Mark of the Beast, we, we've talked about the importance of context. Audience relevance is of utmost you know, importance that we have to pay attention when we read the scriptures that we, uh, we're paying attention to what, you know, what it meant to the original audience. I'm glad to say, matter of fact, I have to boast in this. Uh, just this morning, uh, our congregation here, the Blue Point Bible Church, is in the local newspaper, the Suffolk News, uh, and I'm quoted as saying, we do not read the Bible through the lens of the newspaper. So uh, again, we need to pay attention to the, the time and the context of the uh the scriptures so um that being said we talked about identifying mystery babylon not as per common commentary or you know uh contemporary commentary or uh, you know society but rather mystery babylon that persecuted the Jew, uh, persecuted the, the prophets and killed those that were sent to her jerusalem which jesus identified in matthew chapter 23 uh then we we talked about many texts we've talked about daniel chapter 2 Daniel chapter seven, understanding the beast and the world empires and the kingdom of God that's going to shatter those world empires. I was appreciative of Vicky bringing up Isaiah chapter nine, uh, where we see that kingdom of God that was going to come with the sun. That's why we believe the prophecies were beginning to be fulfilled uh, in the first century with the birth of Jesus Christ. Then, uh, we, and we talked about timing, the importance of timing. Uh, then uh, we talked about Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, where it says, very clearly that uh, the that the destruction of Jerusalem when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies that that would be the time of the fulfillment of all that was written uh, obviously the old covenant and the old testament law and prophets uh, the hope of Israel essentially and then we we highlighted the importance of understanding Matthew chapters 21 through 24 uh, and how that applied to that first century generation specifically verses 15 through 16 where it says when you see that which was spoken of by Daniel so that's how we identified that fourth beast. And then ultimately what's going on in Revelation chapter 13 uh, with the beasts coming up and these two beasts, all of that gives you a foundation, even if you follow that pattern. And then, uh, and Edward, I hope you'll jump in here in a moment uh, just to see if there's anything I might've missed. Uh, however, some details that we did bring up were uh, the Iron Kingdom relating to Rome, that, iron, that fourth beast uh, of Daniel chapters two and seven. Uh, then we talked about the kerygma, the mark, the term for mark, uh, and how it not, it's not necessarily a literal thing. And we see this all throughout the scriptures, uh, namely the books of Exodus and uh, Proverbs, matter of fact, talk about having things written on your hand and in your uh, on your head, uh, which again talked about what you were doing and what you were thinking about. And then uh, we talked about the beast and what was going on in Revelation 13 and 19. And uh, also, uh, I know Zach had brought up a point, which I don't know that we've necessarily clarified yet, uh, or maybe there's not a distinction, but it's something that I thought was worthy of mentioning, uh, that uh, we see a contrast of blasphemies being written on the heads of the beast uh, in Revelation 13, and then in Revelation 14, 
uh, we see uh, the, the seal of God, the name of God, uh, the everlasting father written on the foreheads of the saints. So uh, interesting points there. And uh, I know we talked a little bit about maybe there's a difference between the head and the forehead. And uh, then lastly, I'll mention this and then bring Johnny on, uh, is that uh, we talked about obviously the easiest way to understand this, which I thought when we went to the seven day Adventist study that they did a good job of doing this, at least while we disagree, at least we know why we disagree. The outline they had provided was identifying the first beast, identifying the second beast, and then after identifying the second beast, as we just saw in Revelation 13, uh, then you can now figure out what the mark of the beast is. Well, actually, you have to know what the first beast was, too, to understand what the mark of that beast was that was being forced upon people to buy that second beast. So, you know, a little bit interesting there. But um, again, if it's studied out, it, it does become very clear. And I think the biggest point that we've leaned in on, uh, and Edward, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, would be that once you get the outside the border, right? I thought that was a great analogy yesterday with the puzzle. Holger did send me a picture of the puzzle he's doing, by the way. Um, but we said that, you know, when you put together the outside of the, the uh, puzzle, you know, sort of the time statements and the context, it becomes easier to, to figure out where all the rest of the pieces, because you know they have to fit somewhere in that peak, that border. So uh, it makes it easier to put these things together. And uh, that's where we have seen the power of context and time statements in identifying whatever the mark of the beast might be. And I know we've expressed that we do believe that there should be given some liberty in that area because it's in the past, so we don't have to obsess, but at the same time, uh, it's good to, to study these things out and understand. Edward, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> I was thinking like, uh, as far as the time statements where everything has to have been put placed in the first century is to where Daniel's statue, you know, with the, with the various kingdoms and how all of them, you know, were um, uh, happening, everything that was supposed to happen had happened at that particular time as far as Babylon and then uh, um, Persia and then the Greeks and mm -hmm. then um, you have the Romans and, and the Jewish uh, people and then it being shattered by Christ. Uh, and none of them uh, are standing today because uh, Christ's kingdom has after 70 has become the prominent and the, the dominant, which will never end. <laughs> so yeah. that, that places everything in the first century, you know? Yeah. So that time statement can't be refuted because those empires, you know, went through the, that process until Jesus, you know, demolished them and his kingdom is, you know, reigning forever. Amen, so, amen. Yeah, the time statements are, are hard to get around, amen. Amen. Well, uh, you know, I think we've we've kind of given the foundation enough. Uh, Johnny had posted, you know, and Johnny's a friend. I'm going to let him introduce himself and and share a brother in Christ. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, let him introduce himself. However, I just want to explain uh, about a week ago, I had seen Johnny post uh, something on Facebook about the mark of the beast and uh, obviously alluding to some of the ludicrous uh, views that he's seen and read and heard. Uh, and then, you know, asserting, you know, what we need to necessarily think about. Uh, when we're trying to identify whatever the mark of the beast was. And I thought that was a, a great uh, beginning step to a blog that he said he was going to publish. And I'm interested to hear uh, how he's working that out and developing that. So Johnny, thank you for taking some time out of your day and uh, being willing to join with us and, and patiently listen to us outline where we've been uh, with this. I want to go ahead and welcome you on and give you the opportunity to share with us a bit about yourself. Uh, and then we'll kind of move through the conversation after that. Yeah, sounds good, Mike. I appreciate the, uh, the time today. Uh, and uh, for everybody there for allowing me to come on and share a bit. Uh, and yes, I am working on a, a blog right now uh, about the mark of the beast. It is obviously, as you all know, you got five days of content on it. It's a very in-depth topic with a lot of different opinions, a lot of different uh, interpretations. And so really digging through the weeds is, is quite fascinating. But it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting dive that needs to be needs to be done, I think, by a lot of people in God, just in general, when it comes to Christianity, because a lot of our doctrines are just knee deep in weeds. And we really don't know why we believe what we believe at times, just because we heard it or a lot of people believe it. We kind of use that as, those, as uh, reference points. And uh, before I introduce myself, I'll make this statement. Um, and the more, the more I'm studying, I, and I don't mean this to be arrogant, because I am no way 
educated myself in the regards of some of these scholars and some of these theologians that have studied the Bible way longer than I have. But a trend that's very unfortunate now is the uneducated educating the uneducated. And just because you are educated by the uneducated doesn't make you educated. And I see that really as a common thread throughout Christianity, where we just don't have qualified people talking about topics that they, I, I don't think they really understand or want to. Um, I just think people want to believe what they want to believe. And then there's a section of people that really are really after truth. Um, and I really think that has to be a fine line. But anyways, I digress. I know we'll talk a little bit about the beast and the mark of the beast in a second here. Uh, like Mike had mentioned, my name is Johnny Ova. I pastor the Sound of Heaven Church located in Deer Park. Um, eschatological church and moving from uh, training up generation to generation to continue to progress and preach and teach good news about Jesus Christ. Just because in its simplest form, the gospel means good news. So when people hear it, it should be good. And that should not be bad, hurtful, uh, hypocritical, or any of that, uh, uh, any of that craziness. But uh, like I said, I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to share a little bit about the Mark of the Beast. Uh, especially on our 10-year anniversary, Mike. I mean, who, who, what better day to spend the, the day with you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, Johnny, thank you for uh, taking the time. And um, again, your, your ministry has continued to be successful here on Long Island, I, I imagine. I know you've had some new developments and things happen over the last couple of years. So, uh, and I know you, you do quite a bit, you, you know, as far as ministry here on Long Island. If you don't mind, uh, I just wanted to give you a moment to share a little bit about uh, what are some of the other things outside of just pastoring at Sound of Heaven, which I hate to say just pastoring, but, uh, you know, outside <laughs> of pastoring, uh, the, the Blue Point, uh, so outside of pastoring Sound of Heaven, uh, what else, what other ministries are you involved in? What, where do you see the need to really uh, for people to be focused on the things of God and uh, maybe what should church leaders be focusing on or what are you focusing yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Mike said, and as I mentioned before, I do pastor the Sound of Heaven Church. We actually just ended our radio show, Mike. I know we had that. Uh, we had you on a couple times for a year and a half. We we're on 103.9 uh, FM radio on Long Island. We had a uh, complete secular audience of 100,000 people listening per show. We were on every Wednesday and Friday night. Um, and uh, unfortunately, what had happened was the church, and it's a good thing, it's beginning to grow and shift in a different direction that required so much more of me and my wife Rachel's time that I just could not make the commitment to do the two days uh, uh, anymore for the radio show. So we got a lot of really great things going on there. Now, as far as the needs of the church and where we're focused at, we just held an event over the Christmas season where we had, uh, uh, it was scheduled to be 880 kids from shelters um, where we turned our whole church into what we called Christmas Town at the Sound. And so we turned our whole church into a winter wonderland and had all these kids bust here um, and uh, we were able to provide them a really awesome experience, arts and crafts, cookie decorations. They got pictures with Santa Claus, uh, got some gifts, you know, bless the parent. And, you know, the testimonies from that were just tremendous. Now, we didn't have the full 880. It got cut down a lot, uh, but it was mostly because that had started really when they instituted the new COVID restrictions. And so the shelters were not providing or giving transportation to the kids. So we kind of had to juggle a few things. But I mean, when we talk about having 20 kids in a room with their parents here who can't supply a, a, a good holiday season for their kids, if they're looking about all these other kids, you know, the fact that just seeing that kid smile, jump and dance, we can't even tell you. My wife has a story of just like a woman just getting up, walking to the back, just bursting out in tears, crying. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's amazing what happens when you just show some love to people. Um, and, uh, you, you know, what really the, the true heart of nature of God will really do in setting people free, you know, so we just had, uh, had that taken care of. And as far as the focus of just the church in general, the church seems to get away from the church. Um, and it, it, it's unfortunate because, you know, the church is so church minded. We forget the purpose of what we're doing. We are scared to have conversations where we differ. Um, we're scared to possibly admit we're wrong. Uh, and what that does is it really turns a lot of people off. And the more dialogue and conversation that we're having uh, with people outside of the body of Christ, the more that uh, we see the fruit of Jesus being manifested in their life in what we call at our, which is our mission statement is to make real Christians. Um, and I was speaking to a young lady 
be friends that was friends with my wife, is friends with my wife, but they used to go to school together briefly. And she is not a Christian at all. Uh, uh, she is, I guess, I, I guess I would label her agnostic. Her husband is a flat out atheist, does not believe in a supernatural anything or God or a creator or anything like that. And uh, she was, she's such a, a wonderful uh, woman and her husband seems like such a good dude. But here's the interesting quote that I took from this. I mean, it quote shook me to my core. She was telling me how she went to a couple of local churches here on the island back in the day when she was dating somebody. And then she went to a Korean church and she, she tried that when she was dating uh, a young man at that time. Uh, and then she was trying to like fit herself into the box. She felt like she always was distant and she never could connect. And this was the quote that really shook me. She said, but you know what, when she met her, her now husband now, who's an atheist, didn't go to church. She goes, the more I got away from church, the more like Jesus, I feel like I became. Now, if that doesn't echo through the core of our soul, that something is wrong and that we need to reevaluate what we're teaching, what we're applying and how we're being viewed by people outside of us, I just don't know what else to tell you, because that's not, unfortunately, that's not a common, common, that's not an uncommon uh, feeling of emotion. It's, it's more common than we think. Mm, amen. Yeah, that, that should provide some good uh, self-examination, you know, and uh, you gave me a good quote there, uh, the church needs to get away from the church. And obviously, you're not talking about the church building, per se. You're talking about getting away from the people of God, that we need to get out there, meet other people, understand the rhythms of our society, understand, you know, what people are. I think that's a, you know, and I'll admit that it's a humbling uh, self-examination to really ask, you know, what are people thinking about me as a Christian when they see my social media, when they they know me as a person, you know, non-believers? Uh, and are they attracted right. to the gospel through my representation of it, uh, you know, ultimately Christ working through me, or am I getting in the way and all they see is me? Uh, you know, I think that's a, a good self-examination there. And, and if the you is ugly, then, oh gosh, yeah, then people have some uh, ugly uh, views of, of Christianity. So, you know, Johnny, uh, obviously this is the preterist power hour. So what I find interesting is that uh, everything you just said is about application and bringing uh, the truth to a, uh, you, you know, to our populace, bringing the, the, the good news, as you had quoted there, uh, to the people around us. I'm sure you've heard the uh, problem with uh, preterism where people will say, well, if it's all fulfilled, then there's nothing we need to do. Or, uh, you know, there's people that will say preterists are too uh, focused on just studying and, and there's no application. Everything you just said as a fulfilled believer sounds like plenty of application, plenty of, plenty of reason for us to have work to do. Uh, you know, so if you don't mind, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey into fulfilled truth and the term preterism and uh, maybe uh, how you've come to where you see the power of preterism uh, really applied and understood. Yeah, and honestly, Mike, exactly why what you just mentioned is why I do not carry the label of quote unquote preterist, but I do maintain the belief of the belief of, of, of fulfilled eschatology. Um, and we and you have had conversations on this and you're like, this is what preterism by definition all really is. But what happens is when we put labels, on, I mean, to be honest, which I barely want to even label myself Christian right now, because what we have made Christianity to be is not Christianity. And when people look at Christian and think Christianity, it turns people away. They don't look at us. They, they, they've already had this idea, the televangelists, uh, the, 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 the money hoarding people. You know, they already have this concept and it's just not that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I used to run a ministry um, more than a decade ago now, probably 15, 16, 17 years ago called the Army for God. And it was an end time uh, prophetic evangelistic army where we would take a whole group of people and go out onto the streets. And to make a very long story, extremely short, what had started to happen was the more I began to, and I wasn't a Christian my whole life. I was saved when I was uh, 17 years old. And it was a, I literally just jumped in and was believing everything that the, the church was teaching because why would the people lie to me? Why, or why would they misrepresent it? And not that they did it intentional, I don't think. Um, I think most people genuinely believe what they believe. And when they defend it so vehemently, it's because they they feel like they're defending God and the Bible and the validity of it. But besides the point, I started getting, the more I got around non, on non-believers, I started getting a lot of questions about the second coming and about the end of the world and the end of the planet. And if I'm really honest with myself, everything that I was taught was an over-exaggeration. Like I felt like I was making things fit without any type of perspective of it. 
uh, of why, you know, and this is different than like apocalyptic language where it's like, well, you're doing the same thing when you make this mean this. Well, the basis of that is this is how they actually taught in the first century. So the words and the phrases that they use during that time has some validity in the background. You telling me hour don't mean hour, time don't mean time, lifetime don't mean lifetime, generation don't mean generation. Nobody has these concepts unless we're trying to make our doctrine valid. It's, it's a forced uh, implementation. And so what happened was the more I began to interact with people and they started asking me questions, I made this decision. I'm going to make a list of all the prophecies that are fulfilled, what's left, and kind of gauge kind of where we are on this prophetic end of the world timeline. And the more I began to study and the more I searched through the mighty Google and the more I looked at different preachers and listened to a whole bunch of different sermons on it from some of the most popular teachers that people were recommending me to listen to, I came to the conclusion that I don't really believe that we are in the end. I don't believe, I think we might have this wrong, to be honest with you. And I was really scared. At that time, my, my spiritual pops, Apostle Axel, uh, was uh, me me men uh, mentoring me and guiding me and encouraging me. And I'll, I'll never, ever forget uh, the time that he spent with me when he didn't have to. And uh, we spoke every day. He was checking in on me. And I remember calling him like, like, I'm like, Apostle, listen, Axel, listen, I, I don't want you to just disconnect and cut me off. But I, I was like, I have to tell you something. I, I'm doing a study on the end and, and, and the coming of the Lord. And I said, I don't think I believe it. I don't think it's scriptural. And he just started busting out laughing. And he's like, well, we don't, I don't believe it either. And I was like, bro, are you kidding me? You was in my life for five years. And this is the first time you met you. You're watching me do that. He's like, you were so on fire for God. I didn't want to do anything to quench it. You know, so he's like, you were still leading people to Jesus. And you were so passionate and so excited. He goes, I figured you'd eventually get there. You studied the Bible. So uh, it was a very eye-opening thing. And then I got a whole bunch of resources from him and John Eckhart. And that really kind of put me on my journey to fulfill that eschatology. Amen. Amen. That's a, and again, uh, good resources. And I, I'm familiar with both of those men and their ministry. So uh, praise God for them and, and what they've developed and uh, obviously their influence upon uh, your life. So, uh, you know, I want to lean in on our topic specifically. And, and Johnny, you know, you had made this post the other day uh, where you, you, you shared this ludicrous interpretation. I actually, the math yep. made me dizzy. Uh, you know, the 36, six times this plus this, <laughs> five plus four plus three plus two plus one, um, you know, and ultimately it ended with 666. Then it, I actually had to go ahead and look up this 1976 film, The Omen. I wasn't familiar with it. Uh, and mm. then somehow they arrived at, uh, I guess it applied in that movie. And then they used obviously that movie as an illustration of uh, 666. And we know that many right. people have been confused since in regards to the mark of the beast. And I thought what you had said, uh, you, you kind of helped people back up and everything that you've said so far kind of leans in on this, was you basically said, how does this make any sense? Is this how we interpret scripture? Uh, who gave anybody authority to read the Bible like this? Uh, nobody, right. nobody would ever come up with this if they weren't told to believe it. Uh, and then obviously did Jesus and the apostles read scripture like this? So I thought that was a great way to kind of back people up and ask them to consider what you were saying. And um, that being said, I I'm curious, you know, you mentioned before that you found some interesting things in regards to the mark of the beast. So I'm curious, uh, you know, can you share some of that with us specifics and, and get into some of the details and then also let us know where you're at with this article that you had uh, or blog that you had mentioned. Yeah. So I'm about, uh, honestly, I thought I was going to be able to knock this out in seven days and I'm only a quarter of the way into this thing. I'm like kind of formatting the titles and, and different things like that. Because honestly, it's a big topic. Mark of the Beast actually gets searched on Google close to 600,000 times a month. So people are very interested in it. And uh, I plan on getting my article up there. So I'm really kind of crafting it to make sure that it gets up there. Because, uh, uh, you know, my marketing background, I want to make sure it's formatted right for Google. But with that being said, I'm, I've always been fascinated about this topic of the, of the Mark of the Beast and how people come to the conclusions that they come to. Um, and uh, even hearing some conversations with you know, again, just how people jump to some of these conclusions that they come to, because uh, let's be honest, there are things that are clear in the scripture, and there are things that are really not clear in the scripture where we have to dive in and do a little bit more studying. And none of us listening today, none of us who even call himself a Christian has 100% authority on revelation of scripture. We're all going to end up going to heaven and being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed this. <laughs> Crazy. 
Um, but some things are very clear and obvious. Like Jesus is the son of God. He died on a cross. You know, these things are very obvious. There's very few Christians who disagree with those statements. Um, you know, just because they are extremely clear in the Bible. So firstly, to portray the mark of the beast as extremely clear is just, is just foolish. And I think there are come, some things that are topical and high in view that we have to consider. The first thing is just language. Language is very tricky because everybody uses different language and different lingo to begin with uh, in the first place. So we have to, when we read the Bible, we have to really do our best job not to define every word uh, by our 2022 Long Island, New York, or U United States of America definition of the words and how they are. We have words and phrases that change on a daily basis. Like, for example, if I said, Mike, bro, it's been a minute. I haven't talked to you in a while. You know, if I wrote that down on a piece of paper and I emailed that to you, and then 2,000 years later, somewhere in Israel, somebody picks up that email and he's like, why is he saying he hasn't seen Michael in 60 seconds? Well, that's because a minute is not wow. technically 60 <laughs> seconds. Right, right. We know what we're, yeah, we know what we're talking about because we're living in the time. We know our language and lingo. And right now, if you go across the pond to London, right, they call their donuts biscuits and different things like that. Like there's different language gaps and barriers that we really have to consider when studying the word of God. And that's current day going across the world. Now, wind this bad boy back 2000 years, 2020, 30 years, go back to the first century on the other side of the world, they taught in such different words and, and phrases. I mean, we could see this today if you tried to read the King James Version American Bible, which was not as long ago as the first century, but yet how hard is it to grasp that concept of understanding the word? Of, it's like you're reading almost a completely different language. So I think understanding language and context is extremely important. So without diving too much deeper into that, there are some things that I have to consider when talking about the, the mark of the beast. And so the first thing is the one thought that I first had was, why are we so stuck on the number 666 in the sense of a very literal version of it? The verse in, in Revelation 13, 7, literally, word for word tells us to calculate it. So we're not supposed to take the number as is literally. There is a calculation, and it starts out with uh, the who has wisdom, let him calculate the, the number of the beast and gives the, the number out. Uh, and so very similar to when Jesus was teaching in parables, right? You're looking at a parable, and anybody who didn't have understanding are looking at him with 10 heads, and uh, he's going, those who have ears, let him hear, which he's saying almost like that nudge, wink, wink. You know, listen, if you really understand what I'm saying, you get what I'm really saying, you get what I'm saying. Um, and uh, that's why he kept using that phrase, because there were deeper meanings to be meant by the parables. We're not supposed to be taking these parables as, all right, let me go put some shekels in the ground now. Or let me go to a legitimate wedding feast or, you know, and so it tells us to calculate the number. As far as the number goes, I am kind of up in the air on a few things. And I had this really awesome dialogue. And I'll recommend this out there. Mike, I'll send you the link afterwards if you want to put it in your, your, uh, your, the link of the show. Um, there's a tremendous professor at Harvard, uh, Yale University. Her name is Dr. Shushma Malik. And she is a young uh, Indian woman who's from London. And she is a lecturer. And she is a literally a genius on Roman history, specifically when it comes to Nero. And she actually has a book out there called The Anti... Uh, I have it right over here. It's literally called the uh the narrow antichrist founding and fashioning a paradigm and now she is not a christian she is just a historical uh a genius and uh, uh she does not believe that nero specifically was the antichrist and believes a couple of historical reasons may back that up uh in regards to the mark of the beast although nero does use some uh historically have some of the things that the scripture mentioned so it's kind of up in the air on her, her belief, but it, they definitely give us questions to think about, for sure. So like the first one, you had mentioned the mark on the head and forehead, the mark on the hand and the forehead. Now, interestingly enough, I, I, I definitely lean your way. That is definitely a spiritual uh, mark and not necessarily physical because of the marks. You see the Lord marks his saints and all that in Revelation 14. Um, we see all that, but it's funny how sometimes scripture has a, has a earthly physical 
uh, meaning with also an eternal impact. Like, for example, Jesus died on a cross. We know that legitimately physically happened through historical records. But we also know at that same time, parallel to him dying on the cross, that he also initiated the birth of the new covenant where now faith in Christ was possible because he sits with the father. So there was like a dual kind of a thing going on at the same time there. Now, we do know historically that Nero, so if you calculate the number, and I've seen this in a couple places, that when you look at the Young's Little translation and go back to some of the original text, you see the number, not just the number 666, it's 600606. And uh, you could also recalculate that under the Roman rules of their language. And it spells out Nero Kaiser. Um, and I've seen that before. Uh, I've also seen, which really kind of stakes the claim and pushes it a little further, which is also why in some of the old Latin books, the number of the beast, the mark of the beast is 616 and not 666, 600106, uh, which also spells out Nero Kaiser in the Latin language when you flip the numbers and the letters together. And then marry that with the historical records of when Nero was persecuting the Christians. Uh, he wanted to be worshipped as God. We see that he did put a clamp on the marketplace. And if they did worship him as God, he wrote his name on their hands or on their forehead. So could that be what is being referenced in Revelation 13? Maybe, you know, but again, that would, I mean, technically that would be 666 in the way we understand it on their, on their hand and on their forehead. Um, so we see a couple things like that, you know, also in regards to who is the beast, I think you have to figure out which John was sent to Potmos. I know the popular version is the apostle John, uh, but we see that it was under the rule of Domitian that John was sent over to Potmos, but Domitian wasn't in, uh, and it wasn't an emperor until 81 AD, which would then go against a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, us as fulfilled eschatology, the preterism view of 70 AD being the end-all be-all, but I'm not so sure, based on some of the records that me and Dr. Shushma have spoken about, I'm not so sure that uh, he was emperor when he sent John over to Potmos, because he was also a high-reigning official in Rome before he was named emperor, who did have the power to put people in jail. So that's also another way that he could have sent John over to Potmos before he was a Roman emperor in 81 AD. Uh, and you could see that historically, but she has a really awesome um, interview on this podcast It's called The Ancients, and I'll send you the link to it, Mike, and, and she's on there. It's a show just all about ancient history and antiquity, and you could literally just download the, it's free on, if you listen to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, if you listen to The Ancients, you could type her name, uh, or you could just do a search on Nero, and she's got two, two hour long podcasts on her conversations about Nero. Uh, one of the other things that I think is an interesting uh, timeline of it historically, and I know this is a lot, but I, I know we're crunch of time, but just to give people some things to think about. The other interesting point that she brings up that I thought was pretty fascinating is we have this narrow viewpoint as like the beast. And we know that he was, that he was referenced to as the beast historically by some people, uh, but he really wasn't a, uh, and I know he's looked at as the Christian tormentor in a lot of popular circles, but that wasn't necessarily the case uh, for a few reasons, and this may be a further talking point, and that is when, when the Christians of the first century were like, to be honest, like peons to the Roman emperor. They, they did not care. This would be the equivalent of Mike, me saying, yo, Mike, this four-year-old said you were a jerk. Weird. You know, that's okay. You know, would it affect your life? I hope not. You know, but the Christians we're, we're, we're looked at this like annoying group of people historically because they were the only group of people that were trying to convert people from this polytheistic belief to monotheistic belief. Like, like where a lot of the Roman Empire would adapt to all these worship of different gods, the Christians were like, no, 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 one God and one God only, and we're trying to force people to believe their way. So they were kind of looked at this really annoying thing, annoying group of people. Nero uh, was, uh, was, was a very odd Roman emperor. He was very different than all of his predecessors. Uh, uh, Nero had this big kind of, um, kind of outlook on, on, on music and theater and playing all these different instruments and stuff, which was really kind of like a slave thing and not necessarily uh, an imperial, imperial uh, position. And so what's fascinating is that um, when uh, the, the, the fire of Rome first burnt down that library, he needed a scapegoat because the rumors were going around that, that, uh, that he did it. And probably he did. Don't know for sure. 
that he did it and he needed a group to blame and everybody hated the Christians anyway. So we literally just blamed the Christians and started that revolt in 66 AD for no reason. Um, but to further that point home a little bit, which I find interesting is that when, when, when everybody in the government tried to turn their back on Nero uh, before he killed himself, he went to East. He went over to where, where, where the Israel, the Jewish people were because they were almost like, it was almost like a safe environment for him over there, uh, which I also find fascinating too. Interesting historically. So, you know, is, you know, I lean towards Nero being the Antichrist uh, uh, I, more than I don't. I just don't land 100% on it. But there is a lot to think about when talking about the mark of the beast, the number of the beast, what that mark was, what it did physically, and what fit legitimately happened that you could historically point to, but also spiritually what that meant and what was happening uh, at that time in the first century as well, too, which I do lean, uh, again, towards your point of view, uh, as well, I do believe there's a heavy spiritual meaning on that in regards to, you know, the hands and the forehead uh, and what that means. Yeah, amen. If I may uh, jump in and Edward, I'm interested to hear some of your thoughts as a follow up. Um, what I'd, I'd like to say is, uh, first off, I appreciate the maturity that's happened within the uh, the preterist community, because early on, you know, right away when we see the framework, and I think this is where we would all agree. Uh, the framework is the first century. Again, Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, don't really give you a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the fulfillment of uh, the time of prophecy, unless you want to reinvent another part of history that's supposedly supposed to happen. Uh, but other than that, you know, Luke 21, 20 through 22 tells you when you see the city of Jerusalem surrounded by armies, this is the time and a time of fulfillment of all that uh, fulfilling all that was written. So uh, we see that. So we, we at least agree it was the first century. Now, the point I'm bringing up about the maturity in the preterist community is that uh, early on, it was a very obsessed view of Nero. Everybody would always focus on Nero. Uh, then, you know, the first person I had heard that kind of branched out was Adam Marshall. And I'm hoping he might even consider joining us either this week, next week, uh, to talk a little bit about his writings, uh, maybe not so much focused on the mark of the beast as I'm hoping to at some point bring this to a conclusion. Uh, however, um, you know, again, he he kind of went outside the bounds of AD 70 and he, he leaned in on some other details uh, that I thought were interesting. And then also, um, then uh, Holger Neubauer, who we had on yesterday, he's obviously rejected the Nero view because he believes that Gematria, uh, you know, the Church of Christ, they have an interesting view where uh, if the if it, you cannot find it in the scriptures, while history might support it and be beneficial, yes, they want you to find it in the scriptures. And Holger's done a great study, in my opinion, showing that the Jewish mind would have immediately thought of the high priest and would have thought of a lot of Jewish things rather than a constant assertion about the Romans. So while I do believe that the Romans have a part of that uh, that history. Uh, I believe there's also a Jewish focus in that time frame that has been a, a leading view uh, within the preterist community uh, in understanding those things. So, Johnny, uh, I appreciated you saying the phrase up in the air on a few things, because I believe that's where we should be. I believe that, you know, otherwise you're going to become obsessed. You know, what we need to do is be comfortable with understanding the context, the time frame. Obviously, what we would say is we're not wait, we're not concerned about the mark of the beast now. Uh, there, there's, you know, there's, there, it's, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. You, you know, there's so many promises that go against this common understanding of the mark of the beast. Probably one of the reasons why we were talking about the secular world, not necessarily appreciating us. So, um, you know, that being said, I marked out some interesting points that you brought up, uh, especially like calculating 666. I'm interested to hearing more from this doctor that you had, uh, brought up from Harvard and, uh, well, I'll wait on those resources. But again, I appreciate some of the things you highlighted. And uh, what we'll do uh, is we'll just make sure we encourage people to, uh, and we'll post it uh, when you do write the article and you have the resources up. Uh, we'll make sure we share that uh, in the future. And of course, I want to encourage you uh, to go ahead and check out our, our resources because we've really been going through it, not only here on the program, but we also provide links and resources to quite a few other uh, uh, different things that uh, shed a different, a couple of different perspectives. While you were talking, I did share a, a, a graphic on the screen that was the illustration of the Nar Naron Kaiser uh, and how that ultimately equals 666. Uh, I had a graphic from Joe Daniels. He had a book uh, where he explained that. So I was able to throw that up on the screen there um, to help people get a, physical, more, a more visual illustration. And um, cool. I appreciate that. And Edward, I want to go ahead and invite you to share some thoughts in regards to what Johnny said, if you have any. Yes. Um, 
I wanted to, to comment on the preconceived ideas of, of, of the people that are turned away from the church. Um, it's audience relevance, like, um, like Paul. Um, like Paul said, you know, to be like, okay, to the Greek, I'll be a Greek. You know what I mean? That scripture that talks like yep. that. And then when um, Peter and those that have followed Peter were sitting amongst the Gentiles, and when some of the uh, uh, authoritative people had come in, they had removed themselves, you know, and Paul, you know, kind of called them on that. Um, see, this, this is basically um, what it's about as far as, you know, um, meeting people where they are, um, talking to people, you know, according, you know, you know, meeting, like, yeah, meeting them where they are, you know, uh, they don't have to try to get themselves to a point where they can come to church or something of that nature, or, you know, uh, they, they need to be able to feel comfortable coming as they are, feel the love, you know, the grace that has been granted to us, we can extend to them and things of this nature, which they do not see. And this is what turns them away, you know, but like if we were to conduct ourselves as Paul has, you know, uh, we will have a more effective uh, 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 missionary uh, ability. Amen. Well, yeah. Uh, so, my, oh, Mike, I, I, I want a quick comment. Are we up against it right now? The time frame? No, no. Go ahead, please share. Yeah. So, I wanted to comment on what you had mentioned that Holger had said yesterday, um, and I think there's a balance there about, like, again, we have the support, we have the history, but find it in the scripture, right? And I listen, I am sola scriptura. I, I believe in the Bible, the word of God. I definitely believe that. Um, but there are some things that you, in order to pull the fullness out of scripture, um, we need to look outside scripture to mm -hmm. define the understanding of scripture. Right. And there is a, there's a balance because you have the people where it's like, like, for example, 70 AD, right? Tell me in the Bible where it says, that this end was the fall of the temple and it happened at 70 AD. And to me, the absence of that event being recorded in scripture is proof also that that's the main temple of worship falls and crumbles to the ground. Not one single person around Jerusalem mentions it uh, in the scripture after right. it happened. That doesn't make any sense. Like the, the non, the not, so, so you have on one side, we'll find that 70 AD was the come. And then on the other side, it's, you know, well, we know that this happened as a fact. It's one of the most frustrating things that I see in Christianity. I've had many of these discussions where I go, well, this building, this temple fell in 70 AD. And they literally go, well, that doesn't mean anything or it's nothing or it doesn't say in scripture. So I don't believe it's like, listen, you can't argue with the fact that that building fell. We could argue what maybe what that now means for Christianity or have a dialogue around that. But we cannot argue facts and so if we we could argue like i said interpretations of the facts or what they mean or how to apply them um and those are always great discussions but it, it, when we're talking about specific literal things that we know they learned taught and understood and then same thing with the language the bible doesn't say all right guys so you read in this first century these first century letters um i would strongly encourage you to read up on apocalyptic language before you dive in no we know that because we have to look outside the scriptures to see how they taught so that when we read the scriptures, we pull out the fullness of them and in our understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. May I make one more comment real fast? Please jump in, Edward. Okay. Basically, um, um, like, like uh, Johnny had mentioned about balance, is that, okay, we need, we need scripture. We need uh, biblical hist history, you know, in, uh, in combination. And... If you're going to do deal with something like gematria, um, uh, it has to correspond with what we have in our understanding. Because if you base completely on gematria, you know, which is in imbalance, uh, gematria can come up with all kinds of names and peoples and things that people would like to interject into it. But if you combine it with what we understand and what we already have, you know, it may make more sense and uh, be more applicable, you know, but it right. has to be that balance, you know, where, where it 
if it doesn't conform with the scripture, it has to conform with the biblical history, you know, Correct. so, yeah. Amen. I, again, yeah, I think I agree. There's a, I agree. You know, there's definitely a balance between the way that we have to handle history and scripture, and we have the, both of them are necessary. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. And you know, a lot of what Johnny had said actually uh, also corresponded to what Edward highlighted in the beginning regarding, um, you know, that we're 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 all informed by certain traditions. We don't come to the scriptures, you know, plainly, uh, plain minded. Right. You know, we come informed by different traditions. We we have cultural context. We have even individually, we have ways that we've been uh, given, you know, thoughts and perspectives have been taught things, uh, read things, etc. So there's so much that goes into, you know, uh, pulling together a biblical worldview. It's not just let me open up the Bible and read it. And, and you know, that's just you're fooling yourself and you're probably not reading your Bible if you're saying that. So, uh, right. you know, let's let's be clear in that regard. So, um, you know, so we are kind of up against the time. Um, Johnny, we're going to look forward to your resource. So uh, I'm going to keep everybody. Yeah, definitely, man. And uh, obviously we'll add it to our uh, resources that we're collecting on the Mark of the Beast. Uh, the power of preterism.wordpress.com continues to be a website where we we provide resources regarding the power of preterism i know we've put together resources on the feast of the lord we've put together now this is obviously going to be a running resource on the mark of the beast uh, i believe we have some on the resurrection of the dead uh different topics and concepts in regards to uh, the truth of fulfillment and the power of fulfillment so uh, we want to encourage everyone to uh to visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. And if that's too lengthy, just visit powerofpreterism.com and follow the, you know, the, the links there and it'll bring you to the blog. Um, Johnny, thank you again for joining with us. Uh, I wanna give you the opportunity before I bring us to a close uh, to share any last thoughts or any comments that you might wanna uh, share with anybody listening or with us. Yeah, uh, you know, and again, Mike and, and everybody there, I really appreciate the time today. Uh, to, to chat a little bit about the Mark of the Beast. I, I am going to be putting a very, very lengthy resource together, uh, you know, you know, not just for you guys, but hopefully for the world. I think, you know, uh, the preterism group, you know, and Mike, maybe this has changed since last time we have spoken. You know, I feel like resources and updated resources is a key. Following the trend, short videos, just things that inter people interact with more that get people to think and just kind of turning the mind on a bit. And letting people kind of check in because it's some of these concepts are very it was abrupt for me man it almost messed me up and there's a lot of people that when you cr come down against a very popular teachings they need time to kind of marinate in it a little bit and they need the grace and love just like we were given too and again we're wrong in areas too so just as people who know more than us give us grace and time none more than god himself uh you know we really need to allocate that to people and really when it comes to these doctrinal things, it's always fascinating because I think as Christians, we need to really anchor our faith in the validity of scripture and truth and Jesus's words um, and really kind of study that out too. Like first Peter three fifteen, always have an answer, you know, to anyone who questions the hope that is in us. But at the same time, as we're in our studies and working through our doctrines and stuff like that, none of that should ever, 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 ever affect the way, the, the way we treat people and how we love people and how we make people feel because people will always remember how, how you make them feel and it's uh, i'm so proud of the sound of heaven church in regards to i, I love it but we have so many people who are legitimate non-believers matt michael is legit non-believers that say to us all the time like listen i don't agree with what you with, with some of the things you teach but man i respect the hell out of you and they donate to our ministry they give to our outreaches um you know, it, it's really an amazing thing when you be Jesus to people, the raw and real conversations that happen to come up. And we've had people that are like, oh, I'm not a Christian. I'm this and that. I love you. You know, I respect you, respect you, respect you. And then six months later, like, all right, I, I want to try a service. I want to come. I want to learn. I want to, I want to do it. And it's just, I'm not arguing with them on their lifestyle. I'm not arguing with them on what's sin, what's not sin. Because bottom line, the Bible says, just come as you are. And if we could all appreciate that value of that type of, love with God, uh, that love of God, it's the perfect love that casts out all the fear and breaks down those chains and bondages where people feel they have a safe place to express their genuine thoughts and beliefs. Uh, and, and again, the things that they're going through where they know that the person they're talking to should be us Christians, have their best interest at heart. And then teaching them the way of Jesus, which, which brings a, an amazing worldview of hope, power, authority, excitement, passion, not one of destruction, fear, hypocrisy, 
uh, death, short life. I mean, it's so anti fruits of the spirit. But anyways, I, uh, you know, if you want to check out our website and some of the things we're doing, SOH dot church, SOH dot church. Um, and uh, you could go check out a lot of our. We have a lot of resources up there as well. Um, I have a, if you click on our blog section, me and Jason do a lot of teachings. We try to unleash a, a teaching a week on there. And it's been getting really good traction on a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, we talk about uh, a lot of eschatological stuff, but a lot of just, again, historical Greek and uh, uh, Hebrew stuff. And then um, we are going to be launching, and this is somewhat breaking news, I guess, um, because the radio show has, has stopped. One of the main reasons, not main reasons, but one of the things is because we wanted to put more time and effort into our podcasting platform. And so I'm having a podcast that's going to probably be launching around March. Uh, first, uh, first, second week of March, it's going to be called Dig In with Johnny Ova. And uh, I'm really, what's going to be happening is it's kind of a, it's going to be kind of a, a long talk type talk show, like a, just a long form, long conversation uh, type of just chat about just stuff, life, history, Bible, more Bible based. It's really going to be about, you know, just talking about the controversial topics of Christian. I guess the, the closest way to put it, but I don't know if anybody's ever seen the Joe Rogan podcast, it's going to be very similar to that but on Christianity when within Christian leadership and even those who have left Christianity and are no longer in Christian leadership um, mm. and just sitting down and chilling and having, uh, you know, one, two hour talk, three hour talk about just life and about why they left the faith or what they're struggling with. And it's going to be really powerful. So maybe Mike, one day you hop on with me, be, be awesome uh, to pop that on live and really kind of discuss the things that I think it's the things that I believe that Christians deal with eternally, but are scared to talk about externally. Mm. Um, like, you know, when we struggle with our faith, cause I know Mike, I'm sure you're in the same boat. There are times you wake up, man. You're like, leave on this anymore. Or do I really, but your, and it's those battles that you have, like, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? You know, all right, I'm about to turn my, I changed my mind on this. Is this, is this good? Is this bad? Or, you know, am I doing, am I going the right direction leading a team of people? You know, like the things that leaders deal with on a daily basis. Uh, just being able to air that out in the open and being really honest and genuine and transparent. I think it's going to bring a lot of healing to Christianity. But again, I, my goal is, is that it, 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 it prods people's thoughts like, hey, I've had these thoughts. I've had these questions about scripture, about myself or whatever the topic may be. But that it cr provides, again, safe environments for people to genuinely and honestly discuss these topics. Amen. That sounds like some good stuff. And, you know, I, I did want to... Uh... Actually, before I, I, I speak, Edward, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say any other last thoughts you have before I bring us to a complete close here and close us out in a word of prayer. I would just like to thank Johnny Ober and that he doesn't be a stranger and that he, you know, comes back on uh, uh, when the opportunity presents itself. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, yes. Thank you, Johnny. And if I may say, uh, yeah, my pleasure. you know, one of the things that you had said that I thought was so important was, you know, in giving people a platform, a space to talk through things. I'm very appreciative of what it sounds like you're about to develop uh, in that regard. And obviously, that's one of the reasons why we decided to make our Preterist Power Hour a daily program where we can start out the day earlier in the day, uh, every day, just having talking about things. This week, we had marked out a specific topic, the mark of the beast for each day's program. However, in weeks to come, you can expect that at 11 a.m. every day Eastern, uh, Monday through Friday, we'll be here. We're going to talk about uh, how the power of preterism has truly been shown in our lives through resources, through interviews, a bunch of different topics. I know I have a list. Uh, second Exodus is something I think people need to understand, the, the, the picture of the Exodus and how that was ultimately being exemplified through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think that's a topic we need to lean in on. I know two great teachers, uh, Daniel Rogers and uh, Robert, um, forgetting his uh, for how to pronounce his last name right now. However, uh, both of the resources will be shared soon. I'm hoping to get them on the program, talk through that topic uh, with them. And again, uh, the goal is to just highlight all things preterist. Uh, a couple last announcements before I bring us to a close in prayer. Uh, many of you know tomorrow, obviously, we'll be here live at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be leading in on this topic, bringing to a close the topic of the mark of the beast. Uh, of course, it'll be a future topic, but we're going to bring it to a close talking about it every day 
uh, on the P Preterist Power Hour. However, also tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Eastern, I will be a part of a dialogue in regards to preterism. I will be a guest on a program called Kingdom in Context, hosted by Sean Griffin. Now, as I've let everybody know, Sean Griffin believes that the teachings of preterism are doctrine of demons. Uh, so I will be on his <laughs> show as a, uh, a guest talking against that. Obviously, the title, as you, if you look on the screen here and you're watching through social media, it's uh, Has the Day of the Lord Already Happened with Pastor Michael Miano and the Power of Preterism Network. So uh, you could view that tomorrow evening through their YouTube channel, Kingdom in Context. Uh, I look forward to having that dialogue. And um, tomorrow, what we're going to do also is we're going to make sure we focus on resources, announcements, and I call it a flashback and a flash forward Friday. Uh, so we're gonna talk about resources that have been uh, beneficial to us over the last couple weeks, months, et cetera. Uh, make some announcements in regards to the preterist community, uh, different things that are highlighting the power of preterism. Uh, obviously give some announcements and an update in regards to the power of preterism network. I'm glad to say that we have finally developed our cooperative board and uh, we'll be moving forward with that in 2022. Uh, and again, all things preterist will be presented tomorrow uh, in regards to announcements, resources, and uh, Friday. So uh, I look forward to also bringing up the topic tomorrow of Revelation chapter 14. I know Edward and I had previously planned to uh, talk through Revelation 14, and uh, I believe 16 and 19 are going to be texts that we're going to take a look at. I know I might have just thrown you for a loop, Edward, uh, with Revelation chapter 16, but in my studies, I found something that I think needs to be linked uh, to uh, in our discussion uh, in Revelation chapter 16. So I'll be bringing that up a bit more tomorrow. So Edward, thank you for joining me so diligently each day. Uh, Johnny, thank you for taking some time out of your day. If you don't mind, I'm just going to close with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, okay. we thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, to have this time together, to fellowship in you, Lord, to know your truth, uh, not because we're smarter than anyone else, not because we're better than anyone else, but Lord, because you, through your spirit, continue to reveal these truths. And of course, we thank you for giving us that diligence and that desire to uh, long for and to understand these things. Uh, and we just continue to glorify you for your work through us, nothing in and of ourselves. And Lord, we do pray that you would continue to cause us to be a light that shines, Lord, a light that shines brightly and that people desire to come to the light rather than a light that shines and people want to get away from that annoying light. Uh, Lord, help us understand these things. Help us to be humble in our approach and help us to be convicted in our understanding. Lord, uh, we thank you for the truth of fulfillment. We thank you for the truth of all that you have provided pertaining to life and godliness. And we trust you, of course, for the increase. Uh, give us uh, continued attitudes of worship, Lord, as we move forward, desiring to love you with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Go in peace. Amen. God bless. God bless you, brother. God bless you guys. Thanks again.